day before April Fool's Day, everybody, even though this will be released on April Fool's, along with my interview on a certain podcast that involves the consumption of beverages. This is so episode, is somebody go oh, sorry. This is episode five. Are we up to episode five, Chuck? I think so, yes. So Chuck is nodding approval, episode five. So um, we're two weeks out from DrupalCon, which I know Potter and I have been stressing over um, and getting some stuff prepared, but uh, so this will probably be a shorter one. But uh, does anybody have anything to show today? Chuck, you don't get to answer. You're gonna have to show the progress you've been making on the theme layer because we were high-fiving at the coffee shop about how stupidly easy it's getting. It was pretty um, awesome. <laughs> Potter, did you have something you wanted to talk through or swear through or get angry at on screen? Uh, yeah, I um, don't really have anything quite prepared because I was derailed a little bit before this. But um, we have LRN web components. And we that, that is a monorepo that was created by our tool called WC Factory. So that is one factory. It's a monorepo. Then we have another factory that we're working on called WC Factory. And inside of WC Factory, I need to use some elements that are inside of LRN web components. So these are two separate monorepos that we need to be able to link together to develop. Right, well, mine is a story of side quests. And I had embarked on, uh, on an adventure with a rich text editor and ended up realizing I needed a few things. So what I have to show today is the result of sort of being derailed from that, but still making progress that can go back to the main quest. And, and that has to do with absolute positioning and popovers. Ooh. <laughs> and uh, I threw something together in the last since 6 a.m. this morning um, that will make, make you all very happy. Uh, it's a new type of uh, hacks schema wiring uh, target called hacks upload. So all of our SRC URL type of targets that we have in hacks normally will now have the ability to drag and drop upload or supply a URL, uh, which is a huge UX improvement. So um, Potter, are you queued up to, to, to drive, so to speak. <clears throat> yeah, we can give this a shot here. <clears throat> so in the blue corner, we have LRN web components. This is our behemoth of uh, a monorepo that has all of our handy dandy elements. So about 200 of them. Um, in the red corner, we have WC factory. So WC factory is what builds something like LRM web components, but it is a monorepo in and of itself. So I found myself in the scenario of I'm developing a UI for WC factory and I need a form so that you can fill out what your factory name and what element um, um, information that it needs. And in LRM web components, we have a component that that handles forms nicely and it is called what was it hacks form yeah it's like hack schema form or something hack schema form there you go perfect so hack schema form isn't published to npm yet so how do i get it into wc factory because to add a dependency to work on, uh, to, add, to add a dependency to your project, you go into package.json and you go under dependencies and you add your dependency. So we'll do LRM web components, hacks body slash hacks schema form. Or no, we just need hacks body. And the version for hacks body is 2.0.8. Okay. Which isn't published yet. 
So how do I get it from this monorepo to this monorepo? That's my question. So that you can work on both independently, publish both independently. Correct. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so to understand what the potential solution is, is you, we need to understand how these things are, are managed, how monorepos are managed uh, to begin with. And that is through something called yarn workspaces. If we look at the package JSON for WC factory, we'll see this workspaces property. And underneath workspaces, we have, we're telling it where all of our nested projects are located, in this case in packages. And so what Yarn Workspaces does, whenever you run Yarn install, it goes through everything, all of the um, projects that are under the packages folder, makes a gigantic dependency tree, and then installs, smushes them all together, and makes one top level node modules uh, directory. It then figures out, hey, does, does this package rely on this package? Because if it does, what I'll do is I'll create a symlink inside of the node modules directory. And the benefit of that is you can now work on changes inside of uh, this common package while you're developing inside of this UI package. So it really makes, it takes care of a lot of workflow headaches uh, whenever you have multiple uh, NPM packages that you're, that you're developing. The problem is, is that this learner workspace doesn't know about this learner workspace, this LRM web components learner workspace. So we have to mesh the two together. And uh, so yeah, that's where I'm at. How should we mesh these two together? So the fun thing, uh, in the way that we're actually doing the, uh, the companies, or sorry, the factories, um, we're only, we're like kind of bastardizing our usage of both Lerna and Yarn Workspaces. So what you described is correct for Yarn Workspaces, although we're not really using them that way um, after about halfway through what you're saying. Okay. So it's like we're abusing the fact that Yarn Workspaces will gobble together all the package JSONs, right? And mm -hmm. then Yarn Workspaces will um, generate one, or sorry, Yarn Workspaces won't generate the sim links. Lerna will generate the sim links. Okay. Try and let you work on them. The problem though uh, had to do with the deduping downstream because of front end development versus node module development. So with, no, with normal node development, um, just Yarn Workspaces plus Lerna is fantastic. It does exactly what you said, and then it just works. What we had to do to get everything to, to dedupe correctly, which uh, for those watching, dedupe is more or less finding, uh, resolving the two things are the same, um, which is critical for web components. For example, if you have two references to your element append to the DOM, uh, it'll fail because it doesn't know, it's part of the spec. Like it has to only have one direction set. If it gets two direction sets for the same thing, it just bombs, which sucks. <laughs> and we've wasted, we've wasted dozens of hours trying to come up with ways around that. So the pre and post install hooks in our uh, factory stuff that comes out of WC factory, the pre install wipes out um, the node modules directory of LRN web components. So for this case, we're talking LRN web components. And then it goes around to every sub project and it deletes its node modules directory. So it goes into element slash everything and then slash node modules and gets rid of that directory, which is a sim link. Then it lets yarn install and do its normal workspaces thing, which pulls all of the assets up to the root. Then on the post install, it goes into that, uh, it goes into every project and it sim links node modules back up to the top. 
so that you can do local development on that module so that when you run yarn start it actually works but then up at the top it um it goes into the node modules slash uh, at LRN web components. And then it deletes all of the sim links back up to the projects and then recreates them. So if you could open, if you could go into LRN web components, Potter and look at the, <clears throat> the post install. Um, I mean, you can look at the post install hook, hook or you could just go to the files on the file system to, yeah, that works too. So LRN web components. So uh, click on like uh, accent card. And you'll see that what, so what would have happened if we didn't do our little routine is you'd have at LRN web components, Lerna would go, oh, I'll sim link accent card. So it would sim link back up to uh, the accent, the element slash accent card. And then because we need to be able to get our tooling to work with the Polymer CLI, we need a node modules directory there. So the node modules directory there would sim link back to here. And you basically get this like infinite loop whenever the front end goes to dedupe references. So to avoid that, the tooling on post install creates physical folders of accent car and the rest of those, and then sim links to the, like that accent hyphen car.js is a sim link, or it sim links to the, SR, to the files in the SRC directory or the files in the, the lib directory. And so you end up getting the ability to just work on individual components, edit them, and then you also get the ability for this not to turn into a deduping nightmare. So um, that's a long-winded way of saying our tooling in the factory, or our our tooling in the comp, or sorry, in the factory mono repos that we stamp out is sound. So if you're hooking in to do development off of that you need to delete your reference to that at LRN web components in your project's node modules folder, and then sim link to the, the node modules slash at LRN web components that you see there. Yeah. So what that would mean is that, and I think I actually need to do a full install here because I switch branches. I'm also wondering, so you, did you actually set up this as a workspace that has LRN web components in it? Uh, that was one of the methods I tried. Okay, because I know you were getting into some weird stuff with like, like files deleting. I wonder if then the pre and post install hooks don't fire in LRN web components, which is the entire way that that works. Right. So I, um, don't think you, I don't think you actually want this to be a workspace that includes LRN web components. Um, right. Yeah. So you, you, what, what Brian was, was talking about is, so my first in, inclination was just to s sort of do something like this, where I go up to LRM web components like that and include everything that's in the elements directory. Um, and and you're correct. This by doing this, it was not firing the post install script or the pre install script. What I was trying to compensate, I was compensating by just running those manually, and it still wasn't working. But um, gotcha. So yeah, that was that was one of the methods. So what you're suggesting is, I do a typical yarn install from this mono repo level. Yes. And then once it finishes, CD into node modules, remove what the at LRN web components folder. Yes. Then create a sim link back to the, um, the LRN web components slash node modules slash L at LRN web components directory yes. that's that's inside of the LRN web components factory. Cool. So the good news is that once we get this working correctly, we're going to build this functionality into WC factory. So nobody else has to go through this. Yeah. And I feel like that might have to be some kind of like a, uh, add a command that says like WCF stitch and then stitch. you like 
something like that, right? Something that ties the factory. Or wait, to keep with our, our uh, what, what, what should we use wordsmith, Nikki? Like WCF uh, conglomeration or like... Uh, you add a new vertical to like a company. Uh, new vertical. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So we're hostile really just... takeover. Hostile takeover. <laughs> takeover yeah. yeah. <laughs> what about WCF take takeover? I like it. Uh, modules. This is turning quickly into the bakery methodology from Drupal with the accounts thing, where it's like bake a strip waffle. <laughs> that was the worst. Nikki never had to experience that. Uh, it's like, excuse me now. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. What? So if you want simultaneous user connections, that's a muffin. And so you bake a muffin. <laughs> Seriously. Seriously, like they have crazy stuff like that in there, in the documentation. <laughs> All right, so let's just say uh, for- the It could be a choir, WCF a choir. Choir, that's- a, yeah, Like acquiring it, you're, you know, you're, Hacks body. Okay. Let's see if that imports. Or actually, I'll import hacks schema forms slash. No, just hacks schema forms.js. Fingers crossed. Yeah. If anyone's tuning into this, we did not practice this ahead of time. Yeah. <clears throat> Mike, Mike just yelled at his screen for several hours, and then I came over and proposed the solution in a few seconds, and it might work. And if not, this will be a really epic April Fool. Uh, this, I got a different error, which I think is a win. So you're saying there's a chance. Yeah, I'm saying there's a chance. So I, I can't confirm it at this point, but it looks good. What is the, um, the error there? Child compilation failed Babel loader. loader. Um, hmm. Okay. Now, here's what I would do. Now we get into, now, okay, now, Nikki, you help. <laughs> bug something to do with Babel as you've been fighting Webpack, Ryan. Oh my god, not on the fly. Also, I put it aside because I wasn't ready to full-on take on that side quest. All right, well, I will report back my findings on that method. Cool. Um, Nikki? So one of the things that uh, sparked this side quest is that we're building a rich text editor. And I wanted to be able to create a, a prompt interface for when you add a link into our rich text editor. And in talking to Collins, he had suggested we follow the Google Docs pattern where you get a popover right in context of where you're editing. And so I was looking for really good popover components. I wanted something that worked a lot like paper tool tip but was a full on pop over and not a tooltip. And I looked and looked and couldn't find something. And so I realized I was going to have to build my own. And as I was thinking about that, one of the big things for a thing like a tooltip and a pop over is calculating the absolute positioning. And I realized, well, why is that not in its own set of behaviors so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you need that. And I'm going to make this a smaller window so I can play with this. All right. So, you know, because there's a lot going on here. You're calculating the absolute positioning of the tooltip or the popover. And then if you have to resize the window, that position has to follow along. And there are a lot of time, a lot of use cases for absolute positioning. And so what I did is I created a set of behaviors. Oh, there we go. I created an absolute position behavior. 
an absolute position behavior. Um, basically, it's just following along and making sure things stay in position. I have it set up so that, let me move this over here. All right, so if I go into absolute position behavior, it's set up so that I have, um, it's basically a mix-in that then the popover can use. And there's a state manager. The state manager is doing things like um, adding a list of elements that need absolute positioning. So it's going to keep track of them and getting rid of them when they no longer need to follow along so that that way we, we don't even have to keep them handy. And then it adds event listeners for things like loading and resizing and mutations. And that way when they happen, it will actually go ahead and set up the position for those elements, but only the elements that are currently in a state of, hey, set my position. So then what I'm doing now is actually using that behavior, playing around with this, uh, this idea of the popover and seeing if I can use that mix in. Very cool, very cool. What's the mix in called? It's called absolute position behavior. Nice. I will use that a ton. I have not pushed that up yet because um, the other side quest I had was getting this new laptop, which is probably why things are a little bit wonky because I don't have everything set up the exact way that I want to. And, and so that was its own, own side quest. But with every side quest that pulls you off the main quest, you end up coming back with the main one with, you know, a little better off than before you started. So. All right, Chuck, you, uh, you queued up. Yeah, let's do it. So as Brian mentioned earlier, we were hanging out at the coffee shop. That's where all the good work happens. And uh, we were looking at my theme that I've been working on. And one of the ways that we get information into the theme is through the JSON file. Uh, so if we look at this JSON file down here, you can kind of see like I have some courses and then I also have up further, I have some blog posts, you know. Um, and so we pull all that information in through this template over here. Um, and the way I was doing it was initially was right here. I was searching through the manifest items and I was filtering them down through um, item metadata type until I got to the news section and then I was returning that. Um, and then as a page is filtered and then splicing off five. So basically I have these, all these images, but I said, oh, you know, I only want to display five of these um, blog posts. But when Brian and I were looking at our, our stuff this week, he came up with a really cool way of uh, making this whole process a little bit more efficient. And the way we did that was by using the site query tag. Um, so instead of having to loop down through all that with all that JavaScript, I can use this site query tag and give it, pass it through conditions. Um, and you can see that the type or the, the path here is very similar to what we were sorting through in that last bit of JavaScript. And the other nice thing about the site query tag is, right, so we can get a list of items um, based on these conditions, but then we can also limit how many we want to show and then in other places I have it set up where there's like a, a start index where you can say well I wanted to start here so in this news recent if we look back at our thing here this news recent you can see that I have the most recent um, five news articles posted uh, with a limit of five now if we go back to the actual archive you can see that I have all these posted, but then I, I have these other two over here that are just like anything that beyond this initial five, they get archived. Uh, and the way that worked on the archive is you can see we're using the same site uh, query tag. We're passing in the same parameters, uh, but we've added this start index of five. So basically saying um, start after five, everything after five, that's what we want to list on this news archive. 
So that was a big win. Um, so now I need to go back through and kind of, you know, refactor um, what I've been working on, you know, as far as uh, this old way of sorting through the material to include this new site query tag to kind of clean things up a bit. Um, another cool thing that we were working on, uh, a problem that, ooh, problem that we had encountered was all the stuff inside this tag is um, like loaded into a slot, right? So we need to be able to style certain things in the slot and the stuff sty the, the styling is controlled through hack CMS base styling. So like on, for example, if I have a link and I want my link to look differently than this is what it would come uh, look like out of the box with hack CMS. But if I wanted my link to look differently, I need to be a, have a way to penetrate deep enough into this, this layer to get to it. And so the way we did that, is, um, the way we have it set up is if you come and you look at the hacks base CMS for something example, like a color, we gave it this mix in property um, of a, for a link and we can control the font size and the, the, the color um, and we can add as many different ones as we want. But then over in our actual ODL hacks theme, you know, this, this theme that I'm working in, I can include those mix-ins through this root. So if I go and I uncomment that out um, and I use those mix-ins that were previously established in hacks CMS base CSS uh, and go ahead and save that and go back, you'll see that my links should change to orange now instead of the blue. Uh, you can see I got the custom colors. I was able to get in there deep enough to style within in that slot. So um, that's pretty much what we worked on. A lot of cool things. Brian has since made a, uh, taken what we worked on and kind of made it into one element. So I'm going to go back through and kind of refactor that. So instead of having news archive and recent news, it'll just be, you know, I, I, I don't recall what you called it, Brian, but it'll be that particular element and it'll handle the functionality of both of those things. Um, so that's pretty much what we worked on. It was really cool. Um, as you can see, like switching through a lot of cool state management things happening where we can see the act, we can target the active, uh, uh, the active elements and style them accordingly. Um, I also worked in some of the stuff that Brian had made with the breadcrumbs. I thought that was really cool. So I put those in and then also the previous next buttons. Um, there's still, we still got to work out some of that stuff. Um, but you can see that they're there and they work. And it, all I had to do was, uh, if we go back to my blog template here, to use that stuff was call it, right? So there's the breadcrumb. Um, and then all I had to do was ca call it and then import it down in my HTML. Um, here it is, site breadcrumb. And all that state management stuff is neatly, it, uh, it automatically works. So uh, it's kind of nice. So thanks, Brian. <laughs> Boom. The encapsulation of the state into those things is just proving to be uh, a game changer for that stuff. I mean, it, you're you're presenting that, and if and anyone's going to watch this and be like, yeah, of course, you put a button there, and like that single operation to figure out the correct page to go to next is like why people have whole content management systems, um, <laughs> and we. We implemented it in what, like five minutes? Once we got it in play, it's like, oh, sweet. Now it's it's weird because forever been like, I need to build and plan a website. And now I'm gonna figure out, okay, in our mock-up, we're gonna have a left and a right button. Awesome. Those will go to the next page in the archive or whatever. And then you would make that, or like dozens of people would make that both on the design side and the state management side and the back ends to house it side. And now like literally the identical button and structure that power your next and previous, which is broken at the moment, it's I'm getting to, um, is, is what powers my blog, is what powers the buttons on hackstheweb.org, is what powers the buttons in all the other themes. And it's not like a, uh, it's not like, oh, we wrote, similar code or we copied the same idea like it is literally one for one the same so um much like how we've all nikki and i've really stressed like sustainable accessibility that this is you know when you have this by reference approach she rolls out the video player which there's going to be something about in a few weeks 
um, and we roll a video player out there and we get feedback on it and we go, yeah, this is really accessible. And then we get additional insight from a, a, someone from the disability office and go, hey, but you guys missed these three things. Th then we don't have to fret about everywhere that we just use that video player. We, Nikki can update the underlying source of the video player and it's propagated. Um, similarly, right on the state management of those buttons, which is why when you were clicking them at the coffee shop and you were like, this isn't going to the right page. I was like, don't worry about that um, because it's not going to the right page on my blogs and it's not going to the right page on hacks the web. And like, yes, that's a problem. But once we fix that underlying state management issue, you, you just keep working. And then like we push that out and at one point and go, oh, hey, my buttons are pointing the right place. Place. So it becomes like a more holistic problem solving as opposed to you trying to debug how to do a back and forth navigational design pattern as well as state management pattern. Um, one thing that uh, I wanted to point out in, in the site query example is that's a great example of why we like to use Polymer in a lot of cases. Um, because we're baking in so much functionality into these tags that the tags can just directly communicate with one another if you have two-way data binding. And Polymer right now is the, is the only place where you're getting, them. not the only place, but um, one of. It, it does that very well. Yeah, one of the only places. Um, so the, that's a great use case for why you would choose Polymer over something like Lit um, because it just, it makes that so much easier. The other thing is that, like you were saying with being able to style inside of nested slots. Um, that's, a, that's obviously what CSS variables um, can do. And, and, and everybody has that right now. But the problem is, is that you have to create individual CSS variables for everything. And Polymer has mixins inside of their library. So instead of defining you know, uh, a CSS variable for this font size and this font variant and this, you know, font color, you can just create a mix-in for a tag and you can, and it could be an entire, as much CSS as you would like to override as possible. And that, that makes it really convenient. The other, uh, the other interesting thing uh, with that is, um, as I've been, as actually we were digging through this, me and Chuck, um, it seems like the apply functionality might be a product more of a uh, web component JS polyfill than actually part of Polymer. So um, I haven't, haven't got, been able to prove that that's the case yet, but I think it, it's its own thing. Um, and we definitely ran into that with Chuck putting the variables in there because I didn't want to um, in hack CMS, the base.css is just like, hey, set some baselines. I didn't want to put apply blocks in there if it's Polymer specific, because I don't want to tie our CSS to Polymer. Um, although I'm pretty sure if CSS has errors in it, it just ignores them. So unlike JavaScript, which would, you know, brick horrifically. Um, but anyway, yeah, that was, that's a very good point. Fair. So um, two things. One, I wrote a rant. Um, I know I've been doing that a lot. Um, and the rant, which is deployed via hack CMS because it's for testing, is called all screens have rights. And it's a lot of blah, 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 blah. But here's the important thing towards the bottom of it. <clears throat> so this is something that to be perfectly honest does not bother most people. Um, and this is one of those perfect cases of where like, if I told faculty that I was working on this for even like a few hours, they would probably be like that, this doesn't impact what we're doing and I'm tired of wasting our time. But um, I got it so that um, all sites that Hack CMS pushes out now work on every screen ever made. Um, now I can't prove it on every screen ever made um, just because browser stack only lets you go back so far in history. But I, I was able to prove that I could go back as far as uh, IE6 which as it says in here for reference, IE6 is 20 years old. Um, and so let me show you what I mean by this work or, or what the methodology is currently. So if you're on Evergreen, a modern browser, right, hacks the web.org will look like this. It'll 
look like it always has. Um, if you're on Firefox, uh, like the, the most recent version, it'll, it's delivered slightly differently, but it does look identical to this. So it uses ES5 version. Uh, it will correctly feature detect for the next uh, probably eight weeks or so. And then Firefox, the latest version, will have everything it needs to do what this one has uh, with ES6. So Safari, Opera, Chrome, basically everything made in the last five years, you will get these assets delivered this way, with one exception, which is Edge. And so Edge um, causes some issues surrounding st uh, the state management of our theme. So what I did is I made a, a legacy theme, and the legacy theme is one of our themes, right? So this is Outline Player, except I've reverse engineered it to work without a state management of MobX. And this is not the sustainable way for us to build all themes, absolutely. Um, but this is just leveraging the, um, the spec, if you will, of uh, JSON outline schema directly. So Edge can handle you know, web components. So these are all the web components. You get the exact same documentation. It just looks slightly differently. Um, even our silly SpongeBob meme. So this presentation, and this is for not just Hacks the Web, this is any Hacks CMS site. So you're talking uh, Edge, and there's a few flavors of Firefox that could potentially hit this, this, air, this target, if you will. Um, what the selection criteria looks like, because we're in a progress, this is a progressive enhancement um, methodology all the way down, so not in index.php or in, or sorry, let's go view source on hacks the web. So, so we go down through here um, and this is effectively every site, but um, so this is some magic that lets this stuff work on GitHub pages. This is our service worker, right? So every site is a hundred percent offline capable, zero config. I like the phrase zero config. Um, so a couple things here. Um, one, we have a Node.js attribute that's set on body, which then is immediately ripped off if JavaScript is there. What that enables us to do is now Hack CMS will deliver to uh, browsers that don't have JavaScript, which should seemingly be impossible. Um, so let's illustrate that. I'll go settings and we'll do JavaScript search for JavaScript, allowed, and we'll disable it, and we'll go back and party like it's 1990, and there we go. So now if you go to Hacks the Web without JavaScript, you can still access the content. Now, I need to get the images. Uh, it's just a path issue. They need to point correctly. Um, but everything that's not a web component is going to be there, right? So this is, you got text of everything. Anywhere that you've written links, they're going to be there. Um, we could even come up with like a, um, almost like a progressive enhancement version of the content. So I was thinking of perhaps in, um, in the hacks wiring, maybe leaving behind or adding to it something that said like, uh, like a progressive enhancement or Node.js version or something like that. And that, on save, it would analyze that, you know, maybe like meme maker tag and then say, okay, well, if you're gonna present this and there's no JavaScript, then you're gonna take source and that becomes an image tag. And you're gonna take the two text areas and they become the alt data or something like that. Um, some way that we could effectively deliver something to Uber legacy. And when I say Uber legacy, I also mean, um, every version of IE. So let's go back to XP um, and let's do, or sorry, no, not XP, because I won't be able to show it because of GitHub, but let's go to uh, Windows 7 and IE 11. Um, and so what happens through this progressive enhancement approach is there's first Hack CMS Site Builder, which used to be the only tag that was like the only thing on there. So when the whole screen goes whatever color it is, that's because you're getting these divs in place. Uh, Hack CMS Site Builder, though, doesn't actually have a slot, so then it gobbles this up and then replaces it with itself. So this is how you get that temporary loading screen. Um, then under there, there's a outdated fallback. So then there's a legacy player tag that if the definition for it is there, then it'll unpack the legacy player. 
And then after that, there's two iframes. Yay, glorious iframes. So now all content, when you hit save and hack CMS, it generates a scaffold that is the entire outline. So this is just an outline that points to the links directly, right? Because all this data is under the hood. You don't actually need JavaScript to get to it. Um, so then in, oh, there we go. So this is IE 11 then, right? And so now the infl well, decision tree at some level here is technically we could serve web components to, to IE 11. It is so painful though, both as far as stress on the system, as well as the realities of the web, as far as like, do we need to keep wasting time supporting this with the same quality experience that everybody else gets? Um, I intentionally loaded up Windows 7 here because Windows 7 is end of life in January 2020, at which this IE 11 is the highest version of that platform on Windows 7. Windows 7 goes end of life, People are not gonna upgrade off of Windows 7 to Windows 8. They're gonna go to 10, 10 has Edge, Edge will have Chromium by next year. So I think we're in this gap where we shouldn't be bothering with this platform uh, beyond giving it something, right? So this gives it something. Um, so does everybody, does that make sense? Nikki was shaking her head before and that's always my like, should we cut people off at the knees type of. No, it it makes a lot of sense and, and and i think just having this lowest quality version for anything below might be useful beyond just delivery via browser but yeah i don't think we have to hit you know ie 11 specifically and try to and and you know try to to have it serve the web components. Now you're saying for the hack site builder, we would follow a similar pattern for the fallbacks on images and video. So where so it would just was... drop the, the fallback content in the middle of the tag where there's no slot. That's what hacks. Um, yeah, so what I was thinking is um, that if we added that definition of like how to translate to an HTML primitive that it would actually generate the same content, but then as just primitives and then send it up to the save, to the endpoint for saving and then basically save it to two different files. So you would have the primitives for, because I was thinking about that, but then like um, you and Chuck especially leverage slot heavily. And so it would get really confusing what we were injecting as a placeholder versus the actual content that was to be there. Um, the other issue is that when you load, um, you load stuff in iframes, right? So when it's not in an iframe and it's just here, the paths resolve correctly for those images. But when it's in an iframe, it's not technically in the same doc root as it was before, because this is now in like slash pages, slash whatever, slash index.html. So um, you kind of need the content to be rewritten dynamically at some level for this experience. So I was thinking of um, making like a, archive site version or something folder and then basically replicating all the same stuff in there. People don't access that, but if you have no JavaScript, if you have, um, you know, I, any version of IE um, or, I mean, this works on, I was taking screenshots yesterday running through this. It works on like Android 2.2 and, and iPad 2 running Safari 3. So like this, I'm pretty sure you could hit Netscape Navigator to be perfectly honest with this no JavaScript approach. Um, but having that baked in automatically, I think would be pretty cool. Um, let me go back to, uh, I mentioned, let's, let's go I'm back into to IE6. The, the idea of like the e-reader potential of some. Yeah, that's another good, another good use case that this sets up for, right? I didn't even think about that one. So I can't, so here's a fun thing. This was hard for testing. I can't go to GitHub because the, um, and this is kind of the, uh, the glories of how everything started working one day for everyone as far as front end development. Um, when Heartbleed happened, Heartbleed was related to the browsers themselves not being able to correctly interpret and send um, the encryption message. So you had to upgrade both sides. Like the server had to basically accept everything past a certain point in time because sysadmins universally were like, 
this is a big deal. Like every connection request has been compromisable forever. And so platforms like GitHub and other major vendors were just like, uh, you get nothing. So this is terminated at the server level. This isn't terminated, you know, I, I didn't send a, in, an invalid request. But because we're working um, locally, I can send the page directly from my local host over. So if I get rid of this value, I believe it'll actually let me do it. It's something I can't do in local. There we go. So this, this flag, whoops, sorry. This flag is purely for local development, like, it, and, but yet it doesn't work because it's of the way the JavaScript is written um, in, old, in old platforms. But that, that flag also isn't there when it's published. So like imagine that wasn't there. So this is IE6. And then I just kept going to the article I wrote about all screens deserve content. And then I would load it in one of these and take a screenshot showing it in the super ancient thing. So um, this is gonna let us go back uh, basically to every, every device without thinking about it, right? Because I don't wanna have to think about that <laughs> either. <laughs> and it's been bugging me that we've had, um, this also solves, we've been having some render issues in IE and Edge just because of attempting to support them with the build routine. And so now the build routine is ironed out that there should be literally no device we don't support with something. Not to say that it's an identical experience, um, but at this point we're talking 90, probably 94% of all traffic today will get the correct looking site. And then you've got two and a half percent or so for Edge Edge will get a comparable experience. And then, so you're really talking about three to 4% of all global traffic is on these ancient browsers. So you'll still serve them with something. It's not pretty, but it's, it's, impo it's not worth our time to keep trying to support and prop up these platforms that are never, they're only gonna go down in numbers. So we at least support them with something, um, even if it's you know progressively going away. This is now, um, <laughs> the like most optimized that this index.html file can possibly be for these different use cases. So if you guys ever wanna go really in depth on it, you can sometime, but effectively this is gonna correctly feature detect every weird version that has ever existed along the way. Um, oh, actually, I think it's, it would be better if it was the, there we go because GitHub crushes the file when it goes to the front end. Um, hello, GitHub. Oh, you know what? I don't have JavaScript on. Um, <laughs> there we go. So you can't really navigate GitHub without JavaScript, but you can still get to stuff. So that's kind of cool, actually, that they have their own progressive enhancement uh, policy that way. So this is the, uh, that's probably less desirable. This is the formula that makes that possible. So you have to define a base URL. This also then gets you some of your metadata into Twitter and Facebook and stuff when you paste the link, although not all of it. Um, these pre-connects help speed up the connection after the fact, which is weird, but part of the platform. Um, you can also do a prefetch on site.json so that it knows to get the file before the web components have said, hey, I need this file. Um, then service worker, blah, 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 blah. There we go. So this is another cool one from progressive enhancement. You can do this with modern platforms. So you can do not colon defined, which means that it's a HTML element that hasn't been defined yet. And so see, that's a valid CSS um, property. I think this goes back pretty far actually that you've been able to do this. Like if someone wrote broken HTML or something. Um, so that was a neat one. That's how you effectively get the, that screen on first paint, that big, like, hey, we're loading. And um, the reason for that is so that you don't have a flash of unstyled content, but that you also notify the user, hey, something's going on, right? Because those web components are going to take a while to load for, you know, uh, 2G platforms slash where Potter lives. So um, we've got site builder, then we've got the outdated legacy. All right. So page boots up, removes the Node.js flag, which then uh, the Node.js flag, if you have a slow to paint, you'll actually get the iframe version of the site and then 
once the JavaScript processes, then that'll go away. So you again, we'll at least see something, even if it looks like crap. So on really slow connections, you will actually see the um, the uh, Node.js type of a variant. Um, then we're able to feature detect. And this basically feature detects for, um, for current Firefox and older as like a generic feature detection. Uh, symbol is a way of doing IE11 and anything that's ancient. So if you if you got if symbol came up bad, then you basically a feature detected that it's something ancient. So if we skip beyond that, this is a, a Babel polyfill because we know if we're in here and we're past that, that it's gonna have to be ES5 based content in some regard. Um, so you have to get into Babel a little bit. Then we ship um, web animations, uh, polyfill and fetch and promises, which I didn't have in there before. I didn't realize those weren't in every platform. So this also cleared up some issues. Um, and then the web components loader. So then you effectively get all the polyfills that you'll need. Then this is the other fun one. So if you actually have custom elements, right? So this is, there are versions of Firefox and Safari um, and maybe even, no, probably not Chrome. Um, that hit this weird threshold where they actually did support web components, but they don't support all the aspects of like dynamically imported assets, uh, dynamic uh, ES modules, then serve them the ES5 version. And you have to serve them that stupid adapter thing if, if any of you have read through the docs about this adapter. Um, okay, if it failed on that, then we know it's edge or some weird middle ground. And so then we can serve um, the legacy build, which unpacks with the other site. Then we have to do, and this is, this was the stupidest thing ever, but this is how you get IE six and seven to work. So you have to detect that there was, um, that you're using something old. Previously, I, uh, if you had seen any of the, uh, of the way this worked, it did a document dot write and the document dot write would comment out certain things for the paint through. Well, in um, in ES or sorry IE seven and six and then I'll assume older it would process that and then be like there's a syntax error because it would write that in and then literally break all of the JavaScript that was surrounding it <laughs> it was very strange so um, then we inject the global base styles chuck add and then uh, if you've got an older version of anything then we rip out the um, the ES modules modern stuff. So the other awesome thing with all of this is if you have a modern platform now, like if you have dynamic imports, which someone in the, uh, the open WC channel on Polymer Slack pointed this out, that um, if, you, if you feature detect for dynamic imports, you've effectively feature detected for whether you can serve ES6 or not just because of the way everything lines up. So if you have like modern Chrome, it's gonna go, oh, you have dynamic imports and skip this entire section, which was what a lot of the time to first paint slowdown was before, was attempting to figure out which version to serve you. So it'll skip all of that as it's parsing the DOM, it sees this ES module with the build and it skips right to it. But with the older platforms, they hit this, have to process it and then comment that out dynamically. And so that's how, effectively all of this complexity which has been kind of uh, shunned to do on the front end here avoids intense server setup I spent several hours trying to get server-side rendering working only to realize like this is way more complicated than people make it out to be just like oh just run headless chrome and the end like um, there's a lot involved in just that operation um, so this combo should effectively hit every platform with content. Yes, there's a caveat of like, well, the iframe is heavily dependent on us pre-building this outline, right? So like this isn't some magic approach that just works for every web component site ever, um, but this will effectively work for every hack CMS site ever. So. Wow, well that is an exploration. That was a day back Very in cool. All right, so all of that sucked. So the more important thing is what Nikki's gonna be very happy about right now. So 
I made a new type of hacks tag as far as wiring goes. Let's go to page. Oh, I also fixed this. So this is a custom theme. And then this block right here is Chuck. That's the, um, this is the block that Chuck worked on. It's all the logic that Chuck put into it. It's just now abstracted into like site hyphen recent hyphen content block, I think. And so this has been told, hey, only show two items of whatever's most recent. So it's just the first two items at the front of the array. However, now if I do, uh, let's make something and we'll make an accessible GIF. I can now just do uh, uploads directly into the URLs. Um, and that is now a new hacks wiring target, which previously we wrote like text field, but now you can write hacks upload um, as a valid one. And so now let's go to, um, let's do video player. So what I was building in the background is I was going through and updating every single one of our references to leverage this. So let me find, I don't really know where I have a, oh, I do have videos in Alaska, my videos, where's a, there's a, there we go, to, to make videos, so drag and drop upload. Hey, do you wanna upload to local files? Yep. Okay, there it is. And so, now you can go straight from the making form um, to this, which then of course implies I can go back to here, upload something else, or it's not actually pegged to upload. So I could paste in a valid YouTube link and now it's over on the four, the, the um, episode four code review. So that is a rather massive UX improvement from the e content author side. Which then, um, because why stop there? Oh, that one didn't get the new definition. You know, Nikki's image gallery has upload fields directly into it, which was previously like a non-starter, right, for using this. So that now I can upload into there. There's my image. I can upload the other variations of it, put in some details about this, collapse that, add in image two. And I haven't tested this, Nikki, so, you know, you just apparently wrote something that's all that works well. There we go. All right, save. And now save that. Refresh the page. And mm, oh, it's it's like obscured by this stupid banner image thing. I don't know that it actually pulled the definitions across correctly because I haven't tested that we can write those into the page dynamically. Yeah, it doesn't seem to have those in there, but it does upload the files correctly, the file system. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't save those because we haven't really played with that much, but um, that should now be in for like everything I've got. There's um, some weird local caching issue going on um, with my files. I actually, um, I've switched DDEV off of Nginx over to Apache 2. So now if you are working in Hacks CMS, you can go to a page and then you can hit refresh and it'll still load the page, you know, the way things are supposed to work. Um, but that was a huge issue in Nginx for whatever reason. Um, but as a result, I have some files that are out of date. But like if I do basic, there we go. So now even just a basic image uh, tag, if you just want to do an image, you can do that. And then I put in the alt analyzer so that as you type, it gives you feedback. There we go, that one proved it worked. So all that's then doing behind the scenes is placing the file on the file system. So there's my, that is then replace this form, which is the like, make it a change the manifest of the site, right? Like the banner or whatever, make this be delivered from the back end. Currently it's written here. Um, and then just have the back end serve up like hacks upload fields and stuff, and then it'll just work. Um, which that is uh, a really powerful story. I think Potter that I'm gonna put into the, um, into our presentation is this element itself is like a perfect example of why this approach is so radically different than what everyone's done before. So 
um, that element that we do the wiring to, um, it's, it's leveraging VAD and upload and paper input. So that's why you see the two tags there. But then because we've made, like I was gonna wire to VAD and upload, and it was like, well, but VAD and upload doesn't have all the logic that we need. So you can extrapolate and go, oh, well, I'll make a new tag. And there's really not a lot to it design-wise, right? But all the logic is now encapsulated in this, this transaction so that on um, connected and disconnected, we go, oh, well, before a file has been detected that it's uploaded, but it's all scope then. <laughs> it's the beauty of it, right? So um, that upload field of VAD and VAD and emits the event, and now we've scoped it and, and um, captured it in here so that we can intercept it and go, oh, where do you want to save this? Like even something as basic as that, like that should have been pretty hard to do. Um, That's but, a, this is an amazing example. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was thinking. Let's, let's imagine a world like a couple of years ago where Vadden Upload was a jQuery library or jQuery plugin. Yeah, yeah, that's Just, a good that's point. That's impossible. Yeah, so because it's all scoped, then, uh, then when I wired it into like Nikki's um, image gallery tag, well, the image or the hacks wiring for image gallery is an array and just auto scopes itself to stamp new things out, which all of those things are scoped. So that that way, when I drag and drop the upload, it knew, Hey, you're putting it in this field, not conflicting with the fact that there could be hundreds of the same exact wiring on the page. It's just, a, yeah, it's so, it's so, it's a powerful story that, we went all in on this technology and now we're, we're you're seeing the payoff like you're seeing the, you're 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 actually implementing stuff that would be impossible before and yeah. uh it's very validating yeah <laughs> so this is the um you know if you imagine that tag that when i drag and drop upload it this is all that's in the dom is just a bracket hacks upload field um, and then form data is file upload. Um, and then hacks, and actually, I don't even know that that part does anything. Um, hacks upload then becomes a valid schema type. So when we write um, LRN elements, like video player, that's where I implemented this first. Um, we go to video player source, oh, there we go, hacks. Um, what that looks like in our hacks wiring is this source input method hacks upload. And then it just, it just works. There's nothing else to it. Um, but yeah, I think um, until you really buy in, like go in on this, <laughs> go all in on this approach, it's really hard to start to realize that uh, I actually um, I described it on the, to Michael on the, the UX thing. Um, as like, it's like you've got forever, you've had like a pickaxe and you're mining coal. And every time you hit coal comes off and then you keep hitting, you keep working 10 years and like you might get a little bit better at like mining coal, but you're still ultimately mining coal. This approach is like every time that you strike the coal, the hammer itself gets more refined so that when, when you strike the next time, it just automatically brings up more coal but it also automatically increases the hammer so that the more you keep hitting that same stone by the end, you're, you're hitting and you're getting diamonds instantly just because the hammer is the thing that's getting more powerful each swing. So um, that is anybody else have any closing thoughts other than keep rocking on. Great week, everybody. Except you Potter with your tooling nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hacks on. Hacks off. Well, that, that